Okay, so we're doing Parsha's Nusso. Parsha's Nusso is, uh, is understood to be uh, the longest Parsha in the Torah. Um, and it also seems to be extremely repetitive. If you read through the whole thing, it talks about each sacrifice given by each tribe. And of course, there's 12 tribes. It's still at 748. Um, there's also a number of important ideas found in the, uh, in the Parsha that are famous ones that have to do, we have the, we have a, a discussion of the Nazarite, the Nazir, we have the Sota, which is the suspected adulterous woman, and we have the, um, the blessing of the Kohanim, the famous blessing that we, that is said by the Kohanim to the Jewish people. So we'll talk about a few of those things as we go through it. So this is a continuation, of course, to some extent, from what we did before, because last week we talked about a census, how they, the, the book of Bamidbar opens with counting, which is why right, they, I'm sure the non-Jews call this the book of numbers, because it's got so many numbers. It begins with a census. And, um, and here it starts by um, talking about the Levium. And the reason was, is if you remember it correctly, they were supposed to be separated out from the rest of the Jewish people. And they're actually not supposed to be counted in the same way as the rest of the Jewish people um, for a number of reasons. Um, one thing is, is that a, the, a, uh, most of the Jews, well, they would be considered uh, to be counted as part of the census when they turned the age of 20. While the, uh, the, the Levi, uh, any person who's a Levi, they would be considered to be counted as a member of the Jewish community at the age of 30 days. So there's a big difference between the two. Uh, the commentaries tell us that one of the main reasons that there's a, a d distinguishing between the, this one tribe and everyone else is that, that the definition in Judaism of what makes a person an adult to the point where they're considered part of the community is that they're, they're mature enough to be able to contribute to the community, to be able to do things. So in most cases, that's defined with a male when he's, right, when he's able to go to the army when he goes to fight, because here he's putting his life on the line. He's dedicating himself totally to the sake of the community, to this, the country, the nation, all depending who's at war. And, um, and that's how they, they can say that if we need a general rule, right, you know, you might have one person who might be more mature when he's younger, but in general, when they get to be old enough to go to the army, which is then, so then they'd be able to, to be counted. A Levy, on the other hand, um, their life is that they don't work for they don't work like most people they didn't have regular jobs they couldn't live just anywhere they wanted they basically were totally involved with the temple right you have Levi and Kohen and Kohen is part of Levi so really all Levium all of the Levies have dedication to working on behalf of the community in, in other words their entire life is dedicated to the Jewish community not just they cho might choose to do something, or when they get older, they might be required to do something, but their life by birth is that they work for the Jewish community. And therefore, from the time they're born, they're considered to be already dedicated to community, to, right, to, to the Jewish people as a whole, because that's what their whole life will be. The reason we wait for 30 days rather than from the day they're born is that Jewish law tells us that when a child is under the age of 30, he's not considered already to have what we call a chazaka of life. That a chazaka is, is a Hebrew word that means that a person, um, has, you have reason to believe. In other words, a, a, there's a certain point where a person who's alive uh, you have reason to believe they'll stay alive, right? So how long is that? They say if someone lives 30 days, a baby is born and he lives 30 days, you have reason to believe he will live a normal life. He will live, right? There's no reason to think he would die as a baby. Right? A child who has an illness would die before the age of 30 days usually, and therefore after that you have what you call a chazaka. This idea of a chazaka is in everything we do. For instance, if you decide that you want to uh, do a new practice, you start doing some type of a mitzvah that you haven't done before, as soon as you do, you do it three times, by doing it three times, you're making a statement that, I better fix this, I think. Yeah, you're making a statement that um, you're going to continue doing it, right? You're going to do it continuously. If you do it less than three times, that means that you're just doing it now. But as soon as you do it three times, that's a way of saying, I'm going to continue doing it. 
And the same, same idea is 30 days. There's three sets of 10 that a person who's alive for 30 days, you have reason to believe they're going to stay alive unless something happens. So that's why they waited 30 days with the Levi. And, and they're counted separately. Um, interesting enough, is um, it's a funny thing because the, you know, Hashem says you shouldn't count the Levium with the rest of the people. They have to be counted separately. And you know, have to wonder why. What is so important that you shouldn't count them? In fact, it says it twice, that you shouldn't count them together with the others. What, what are they losing? And um, there are some people who, who would like to suggest that, that when something is, happens to the Jewish community, then the, all members of the community are equally responsible. Right? One of the things about, for instance, that we say that it's good to pray to, in shul rather than by yourself at home is because when you pray in shul, you're praying with a community. So if you want um, if you want to have merit that Hashem should answer your prayers, if you have a whole community of people, you have one person who's excellent at Torah study, another person who's excellent at, at the giving of charity, you have all types of people who excel in different areas, and when you're all together, all of the pluses of the people Right, join together, and so everybody is able to get the merit of the community. When you pray by yourself, you're basically praying by yourself. So your merit, what you've done, is how you're judged in your prayer for that day or that occasion. So when we we say that um, that a uh, that you know that when, when a community will sometimes have good things destined for it, be based on the community as a whole, and sometimes not so good. And when it's not so good. Being a member of the community, you, you, or an individual may not be, um, you know, a problem where they themselves are deserving of a punishment. But because they're a part of the community, they may receive one. This, this would be a way of trying to understand a little bit of the Holocaust. Like, like people always say, like in the Holocaust, people died who were apparently righteous people. Why would Hashem kill a righteous person? Or, or, or let's say, let's say we never really know exactly who's who. So let's just say a baby. A baby certainly is not a sinner, right? A little baby. So why would they have killed babies? Like, what could a baby have done that's deserving of death? The answer is nothing. They didn't do anything. So we can get a bit of an understanding from the fact that for some reason Hashem decided that there was going to be a a gazera, um, a decree against European Jewry, and. Any person who was a part, any Jew who was a part of the, that European Jewry, was going to have a problem. Things were going to happen. Did that individual deserve it? Not necessarily. Another individual might definitely deserve it. But we, but, but the community, for whatever reason, received this decree. I'm not, I'm not trying to answer why the Holocaust happened. I can't say that I would know. But the concept behind it is um, that a person would say. I don't believe in X, Y, or Z because this person was such a good person. How could they be deserving of being killed? It's not just. And here we have a, a way of understanding is that the community as a whole is responsible for each member, and each member is responsible for the community. So therefore, if, uh, if the community is such that they're doing very poorly, and this individual is able to sustain a very high level of, of uh, observance with God and relationship with God, uh, nevertheless, this person may be punished just like everyone around them. Um, it, it's, and it's not uh, totally foreign to us because we have an idea that, that each person is responsible to help the community. Right? If, a, if I'm doing fine and I'm religious and everything's great for me and everyone around me is having a problem, I'm responsible for those people. Right? I don't necessarily have the ability to change them, but I don't know that I don't. In fact, there's, um, there's a, a, a famous uh, example in the Gomorrah that I, once in a while I, I tell and the, and the Gomorrah says the, it says the following that that um, the, that Hashem told the angel of death that he he could go he gave him the freedom to go and to kill people um, at the at what was the uh, the the te- during the temple at the times of the temple and um, he said but what I want you to do is I want, before you go to kill people I want you to put a mark on the forehead of every righteous person who's alive today. Every righteous person who's alive, I want you to put a mark on their forehead so that when it's time for you to kill people, you won't kill the righteous. You only kill the evil people. right? So the angel says back to him, what do you mean? He says, the righteous, they are also responsible. And why are they responsible? Because they should have done something to help the evil. They should have gone to the evil and tried to get them to repent. So Hashem says back to the angel of death, but I know, I'm God, I know they would have failed. They would have gone to those people and they would have tried and they wouldn't listen to them. So the angel of death says back, yes, but they didn't know that. 
they, they, the people themselves, the righteous people, didn't know that they would fail. And therefore, they should have made the effort. They didn't make the effort. They're responsible. And Hashem, uh, Hashem took the advice of the angel of death, and, and everybody was killed. And it's not everybody, but those who he would have called righteous were also killed because they have righteous people have responsibility to the community. Right? That, and so you have that example there. And here as well, it seems to be the idea that when Hashem doesn't want the Levium to be counted, it's because he says the Levium are mine. The tribe of Levi is mine. What does that mean? If you remember with the sin of the golden calf, when, when Moshe came down, he saw all of the people dancing and praying to this idol. And so he calls out, whoever is on God's side, stand with me. And the entire tribe of Levi stood with him and said, you know, we're not participating in this. And um, because of that, God said, these are my people. Right? They chose me. And therefore, he, so he, he wanted it that if there would be a bad thing that would happen to the Jewish people, they should be excluded. The way you excluded them was by not counting them together. Right? It's a symbolic idea, but that's where I, one of the ideas that some of the commentaries say about this as to why they would be counted separately. But then um, we, have, we, we get right away and on page 765, 754, even the bottom of 753, it starts talking about what we know is the, is the sota. The sota is a Hebrew word and it's, uh, and it's actually a, um, there's a mitzvah here. It begins on the bottom of 753, just one line. And here it says, Hashem says to Moshe, and he tells him, you should speak to B'nai Israel. you should say to them that any man whose wife goes astray and she commits treachery, or she has an affair, a man, uh, that a man could have lain with her carnally, but it was hidden from the eyes of her husband and she became secluded and could have been defiled. But there was no witness and she had not been forced and then the husband gets jealous, right? So what basically happens is you have a couple, a husband and a wife, and for whatever reason, the man's wife goes alone with another man. That's all they know. Did she have an affair? Did she not have an affair? They don't know. Nobody knows what went on, but it was not appropriate for her to go alone with this man. She's a married woman and going alone with another man. So they, to be more specific, to, as we study the Talmud, we can understand that what we're talking about is not the first occasion where this woman did this, and then the husband see, you know, finds out about it or sees her and says to her, listen, this is not right. You shouldn't go alone with this man. And then she does it again, and she gets caught. Right now, she doesn't get caught doing anything other than being alone with him. So, so nobody is saying she's an adulteress. They're saying she's a suspected adulteress because she's acting in a way that raises his jealousy, and it seems reasonably right. It's not like he's an overly jealous person. At least it appears so far. So, so the, uh, the what happens now is is that there's a ritual that has to be performed in order so that the doubt between them, should, the jealousy, should disappear. And, and we go on, we'll see it. So, and the spirit of jealousy passes over him, and he warns his wife, and she, um, she, she became the, uh, let's see, and he warned his wife, and she had become defiled. Or a spirit of jealousy passed over him, and he warned his wife, and she had not become defiled. The man shall bring his wife to the Kohen, and he shall bring her offering for her, a tenth Ephoth of barley flour. You shall not pour oil over it. You shall not put frankincense upon it, for it is a meal offering of jealousies. And then it says, The coin shall bring her near and have her stand before Hashem. The coin shall take sacred water in an earthenware vessel. The coin shall take the earth that is on the floor of the of the Mishkan or the, or the base of Mikdash and put it in the water. The coin shall have the woman stand before Hashem, uncover her head, and upon her palms you shall put the meal offering. Uh, and uh, in the hand of the Kohen shall be the bitter waters. And the Kohen will then will say to her, if a man is not laden with you and you have not strayed right, with someone other than your husband, then you'll be proven innocent by these waters. Uh, that, that would cause a curse. But if you have strayed with someone, then, of course, then you'll be going to be killed. So rather than go through all of the words here, basically what happens is, is that the Kohen takes this water and he puts into the water, he, he, they take the name of God, which is not just the name that we know, it's a name we've forgotten, that is considered a very special, uh, powerful name of God, and they write it down on a piece of parchment, and then they crumble up this parchment and put it into the water, so that it's like dust going into the water, and it gets mixed into the water. When she drinks the water, standing in the temple, right, she then has... Um, is it one of two things is going to happen? You realize at first that the only ray that she's here, 
right? That it's not like a man is just jealous of his wife and therefore she sh she has to go there. It means that she's the man is jealous of his wife and he can substantiate that on at least on two occasions, once after being warned, she went alone with this same particular person, right? So the husband sees his wife goes alone. She goes alone with with man X, a particular man. He says to her, "You can't do that. It's not right." that you're a married woman, you're my wife, you don't go alone with another man. And then time goes on and she does it again and with the same man. And then the husband now says to her, I can't trust you. And, and therefore the marriage is going to fall apart, right? If there's no trust. So the so God says that we're going to do this mitzvah of putting this in the name of God, dissolving the name of God in water and have her drink it in the temple. If she drinks it and she did nothing wrong, uh, in other words, she didn't have an affair, so then she receives a blessing. And if she did have an affair, she'll die right there. So what happens really is we know that she did something wrong because she went alone with this person. Right? It's, we're not talking about if you come to my office and you talk to me. You're alone in my office. But that doesn't mean that kind of alone. It means something much more, you know, mis you know, you know, sort of shady. You know, that she went alone with him in a place where she had, they anticipated privacy, that nobody is going to walk in or see them. And then she's seen with, by her husband, and then she does it again. So there, there's got to be something funny. I mean, maybe she's not having an affair, but there's something odd, because he tells her explicitly not to go with this man, right? So the fact that she did it again, there, there she did do something wrong. She did this. But did she actually have an affair? So there we have have that she drinks this water. Now, the most, one of the most amazing things of this, other than the miracle itself, is that the when she when she does drink this um, water and it, it has the name of God in it, I, they take this parchment with the name of God on it, which they then crumple up into into like dust and they put it in the water. And we know there's an explicit statement in the Torah that you're not allowed to destroy God's name. But in normal circumstances, if you would write the name of God on a piece of paper and, and purposely tear it up, you've broken a law of the Torah. You're not supposed to do that. So in this case, here God himself says, take my name, write it down on a piece of parchment, and then destroy it and give it to her to drink. And, and, and you'd say, well, that's like a, you're, you're doing a serious sin in order to be able to find out the truth. And the fact is, is that Hashem says, that to have peace between a husband and wife is so important that you can even destroy my name. You can even go out of your way to do something like destroying my name so that there should be peace between a husband and a wife. And and so they do that. And then she drinks from the water. And as I said, if she was, if she did not do anything wrong, she's blessed. And the blessing is that she'll get pregnant from her husband and she'll have a child. And the curse is that she'll die right there. Right, right on the spot, she dies in a in a very painful manner. Um, yeah, and and so here, the next question is: is if we're dealing with a situation where the husband and wife, there's already something wrong with his marriage, right? I mean, there's something odd going on. Even if she didn't have an affair, because maybe she's you know an honorable person. Nevertheless, she did. She also have a husband who's who seems to be very jealous of her, and she that seems to be like sort of egging him on. Like, you know, one time she goes alone, okay, so one time it happens. But then he tells her, don't go alone with this guy, and she does it again, and he catches her again. Right? She already knows he's a jealous person, or she already knows her relationship is strained, and now she's pushing the envelope a bit. Right? So so she goes and does that, and, and what happens is, is that she didn't have an affair, but she has a child from her husband. So this sort of gives credence to the idea that if you're having marital problems, have a child. And you have a child that will bring you closer. But I'll tell you my own experience as a marriage counselor, which I did for many years, and I, I still do, but not all the time. If you have a couple who are having trouble and they have a child, it's just going to make it worse. It's not going to make it better. If you have a couple who are doing well and they have a child, it'll, it'll make it better. It'll become more intense because the amount of effort and strain that they go through just brings them closer. While a couple who's having trouble, it pushes them apart. So how is this a blessing? There's not much of a blessing to give a child to her. So the point being is that, is, that, is that there are many answers, but I think one of them is, is, is an interesting idea which takes people usually a long time in their life before they figure this out, which is that people who are bad people, people who do things that are foolish or people who actually do things that are evil, they actually do things that are wrong, they don't believe they're doing anything evil. Like you don't have a person who wakes up in the morning and says, I'm a bad guy and I'm going to do bad things. 
Like even a guy who robs a bank prays to God that he doesn't get caught. Like you said, how can that be? How can you pray to God that you won't get caught? You're breaking the Torah by stealing from a bank. You're holding a gun to somebody's head, and you pray to God that you shouldn't get caught. Now, why would you do that? Uh, why would you think God's going to answer you? It's because he he has gone and he has corrupted his mind to the point where he actually believes that what he's doing is not necessarily wrong, or that he's a good guy and he has to do this. But he's not a bad person. Bad people don't believe that they're bad people. They don't really do. They don't really. That's not really the case. When you have a situation where the husband and wife are acting out in a way that's really not correct, each one is, is looking at the other one as being bad. They're doing something wrong. The husband definitely is, is doing that to his wife because he keeps catching her, which means he's probably spying on her a bit. He's chasing after her. And she is uh, understands that, that even if I'm not doing anything wrong, I am putting a, a, pro I'm putting like a rock in the middle of my marriage. Right? There's going to be a problem right, with, with my marriage now. And if that's the case, then then why would she do it? Like, if she's not having an affair, why go alone with this guy? Right? So, you, might, you know that your husband's upset about it. You know your husband's caught you. He's asked you not to go alone with this guy. So why are you doing it? Right? So the idea um, of having a child, of, of going and having a child, um, is a way of bringing out the best in a person. What happens is, is that a person who is selfish, right, a person who thinks about themselves, is a person is, is, is usually the person who'll have an affair. A person who'll look at my relationship with other people are for my benefit, is not for their benefit. What makes me feel good is what's important, not what makes them feel good. My getting money is important, not what you get is important. Depending how bad they are, I mean, how far along, how corrupted they've become, it can get worse and worse and worse. The first thing that one finds out when they have a child is that you have to now expand your horizons. Like first, you know, the, the, like we have, we talk about this a lot in, in the Talmud studies, that a man, right, no matter how old he is, if he doesn't get married, his world is himself. When he gets married, he expands it. Now it's him and his wife. Then when he has children, it's, it's him and his wife and his children. He now has become very expanded. Right? He now he's, the definition of me is now me, my wife, and my children. That's me. Like it's like when a man will say to me, you can't, you know, you can't fight with my wife and think I'm going to be your friend, right? Or you can't fight with my husband and think I'm going to be your friend. It doesn't work. Right? Even if logically, yeah, it might work, but emotionally it doesn't work because what happens is you see yourself as an extension of your family. They don't see yourself as one person anymore. So therefore, the blessing comes to this woman that she has a child so that she, that, to send her a message. You know, if you're doing this and you didn't have an affair, then what you're, you're basically are is you're selfish. You're just interested in yourself, what you want to do, no matter what ramifications there are for others. So Hashem gives her a child to force her to come to the realization of what she's been doing, and now she's going to have to give. Because you have to give to the child, right? You have to, you have to, you have to take care of the child, you have to feed them, you have to change them. You have no choice, right? And therefore you start to expand your horizons, and hopefully this is a way of giving her a blessing where this problem won't continue, right? Um, there's, you know, uh, uh, there are many, many details and instances that go through a few of the interesting points that it says um, about her, about it. it. You know, it says that in the woman, um, the woman, you know, the woman dies that she has an affair. Right? It, um, and there, it's because it's a little bit more than simply dying because she had an affair. Because you can imagine this: you imagine this woman has an affair. Now, I, I, every one of us is that woman for a moment. Okay? You know you had an affair. You did it. You know you did it. Correct? Now your husband's jealous of you. He doesn't know you did it. He thinks you did it, or he thinks you might have. But you're the only one who knows you did. Right? So now you're going to go in front of the Kohen. The Kohen is going to give you this water in the temple. Right, so in front of all of these people, and if you didn't do it, right, in front of everyone, it's known you didn't do anything wrong. But if you did it, you're going to die right there in front of everyone, right. So if you know you did it, can you drink that water? Can you do it? It's like you, you're going to go right there, and, and maybe you're stubborn enough that it's about to touch your lips, and you say, and you say, like, I'm not going to die for this, you know. All right, I did it. I did it, right? I mean, how far are you going to go? But basically, if you're going to drink that water, what you're saying, what you're really saying is one of two things. Either you're so selfish that you can't see beyond yourself, even if you'll die, right? Which means that there's nothing to help you. Like, you're so corrupted. Or you don't believe in God. There's only two things. Either you believe 
that that nothing bad is going to happen to you because all you think about is you. You're so selfish. Therefore, you're going to drink the water. Or you don't believe it'll kill you. Right? It's not going to work because there is no God. It's all a bunch of malarkey and none of it's real. So either way, you believe it. You can't because you can't stand up there and say, I don't want anyone to know I had an affair, so I'll drink the water. Because as soon as you drink the water, everyone's going to know it. right? So you may as well tell everybody. And then you'll stay alive. Here you're dead. Right, in a very painful and embarrassing way. So the, um, the, you know, the, the, the people who do this, right? so clearly it's, it's got to be one of those two things. Either they're, this, this woman is beyond, it was beyond the point where her continuing um, will help her broaden her horizon, so she only thinks of herself, or she's, she's totally lost. So here we see that, that, that she, when they're, she's punished, where she dies, Right? The death that she has, the horrible death that she has, is as much for the fact that she went through with this as it is for the, for the problem that she caused. Right? It's one thing that she was an adulteress. It's a whole other thing that she was prepared to get up in front of the whole Jewish nation and, and, and expect that she's not going to die because it's not real. She doesn't believe in it. Right? There, that's also a problem. And therefore, it's, it gives you one part of the reasons why that you actually have, they actually had to go through with this. Um, and it describes exactly what happens to her, and it, it's pretty graphically uh, ugly. Rabbi, yeah. did she say, yes, I did um, you know, have adultery with this gentleman, or committed it. What's your punishment? Well, there's there's there's, a, there's more to it than that. There's there has to be a proof, and there has to be witnesses, and um, you know, a, a woman who will publicly acknowledge that she had an affair, the she will have to be div divorced from her husband. If they agree, if they, you know, she acknowledges in a public way, I had an affair with another man. I actually had relations with another man. She'd have to, her and her husband would have to split up. However. Um, that's not that's that's talking in this case, right? We're not talking about today. Things mm -hmm. have some more nuances today, but there, that's certainly the case. Because here, she's saying, you know, if I drink this water, I'm going to die because I had an affair. So she's making a very public statement. Now, now, if she's punished in this world, like she would have to go to court and there'd be a punishment. That's only if there were witnesses and the witnesses warned her and they were appropriate. The witnesses were appropriate, and that's very rare. Because if that was the case, she wouldn't be a suspected adulteress. She'd be an adulteress, right? If she had witnesses, she had witnesses. You don't need to have to go through this. But if she didn't have witnesses, there'll be no there'll be no punishment here. Her punishment will come to her elsewhere. Um, and she will, um, she'll have to split up with her husband if she acknowledges that to be the case. So then immediately after this, right, I mean, it, it ends on 759, right at the, you'll see the end of the paragraph there, and it says, the woman shall bear her iniquity, period, end, the end of it. And then it begins something else, right? And it begins, Hashem speaks to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel, say to them, a man or woman who shall disassociate himself by taking a Nazarite vow of abstinence so here you have the Nazir, or the Nazarite, and immediately following the story of the Sota. And what is a Nazarite? So, or we call a Nazir in Hebrew. So a Nazir is a person who, for one reason or another, which we'll discuss, decides he needs to have a shock treatment of spirituality. Right? We have such a thing in the physical world where a person has a shock treatment. You can have it with psychiatric illnesses. Um, I'm just using the expression that the person feels like they need some type of a shock, like some type of a push. Because I'm having a t uh, some type of a, I'm in a spiritual rut. I'm not getting out of this rut. I'm not growing. I'm, nothing's happening to me. I need something to reawaken, to inspire me. So they decide they're going to become a Nazarite. What is, uh, being a Nazir means that he has to basically, for the most part, ignore his body. He can't eat certain things that he would, might really enjoy. Um, he can't drink wine, for instance, which he might really enjoy and causes him to get drunk, become more physical. He can't do certain things. He has to abstain from them in order to, to lessen his physicality and therefore reawaken his spirituality. And so he's, so we've spoken many times about the Jewish idea, how what makes us unique is that we take the physical world and we use it to become spiritual. While every other religion of the world says the physical world is is the opposite of spirituality. And if you're involved in the physical world, you will never be spiritual. And we say that's how you become spiritual. If you do business, do business honestly, you do business according to the Torah, and you will be spiritual. And the other religions say, 
no, you can't do business at all. Business is evil. Money is evil. Sexuality is evil. All of these things are evil. And we say, no, they're not evil. You can use them to become spiritual. You can also fail, and they can make you corrupt. So the, the Nazir is on a level where he can't even do that. He has to abstain from the physical world, and he'll get a jolt of spirituality. But of course, eventually, he's going to have to go back to the physical world. He's going to have to go back to doing business, go back to acting normally. And, and, and hopefully, this jolt will help him. Uh, how does he know he needs a jolt? So that's why the Torah tells us, and Rashi comments, the, the fact that we have the story of this Sota, of this suspected adulterous woman, and immediately it tells us about the Nazarite. So Rashi has a famous quote. He says, um, let's see if I can find it, rather than just saying it to you without uh, re actually reading it. So uh, they, uh, Ra the question is asked of Rashi, why does the section of the Nazarite of the Nazir follow the section of the Sota, the adulterous woman? Why, why does the Torah put them together? Because whenever you have one next to other, there's a relationship. What's the relationship between the Nazarite and the suspected adulterous woman? So, uh, so Rashi's answer is, is that a person who sees the suspected adulterous woman will come to the realization about how, what's happening in the world and what's happening to him on a spiritual level, and he will go and, and commit himself to uh, being a Nazarite in order to get a spiritual boost. And the commentaries wonder about this. Like, what does he have to do? Like, it's, it's not his wife. It's not his relative. He just happens to be standing in the courtyard of the temple, and they come in with this woman, and they, 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 they do the, uh, the ritual, and she dies. And it says, oh, because he saw this, now he has to go and become a Nazarite. So what has one got to do with the other? So, that, that, so there are many things to understand about it. One of them is, of course, she went and she, in order for her to have done this, she became corrupted. For her to have had an affair and then to not be afraid that she'll die by drinking this water, like we just discussed, she's going to, she's going to die and she's totally corrupted. She actually thinks she can get away with it and she's not going to get caught, even when she drinks the water. Right? She believes this to be the case, otherwise she wouldn't drink the water. So she has gone to such a low level that she feels that this is the norm. Uh, in order for that to happen, there has to be an effect on society. Right? Society has to become like this. Society has to be tolerant of people acting in these ways. Just like here, you know, you had, uh, it was a couple years ago, they had this, this uh, business that, that the purpose of the business was to uh, assist people in having affairs. Right, that, that was a business. And they, and they paid a lot of money to the TTC. They wanted to put advertising on the buses right, in order to advertise that, you know, why should you only have one, one person? You can have a spouse, but nothing wrong with having affairs. And they would help facilitate it. And it was like a website, just like a dating website. Instead of a dating, it wasn't dating, it was affairs. Right? It was the same idea. You'd go on it, you'd say what you're interested in, when you were available, somebody else would come on and you'd beat up. So they advertised, and they wanted to put it on the buses, and the and the TTC voted against it, that they wouldn't allow it. They felt it was it was uh, beyond the norm of our community, that our community would not would would not accept this, it was, that it was wrong, um, and that statement showed that 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 even in a secular society, that there is a certain amount of ethics that the society has, and that there are certain things that are acceptable. It was just like not that long before they had this whole thing in the paper about women being able to breastfeed in public, and then women be able to, to be un, half undressed in public, right? And, 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 they, and on one hand, and they said, you know, that of course a woman should be able to breastfeed in public, and if a woman wants to walk uh, publicly without a shirt on, she could be able to do it, that the, the, the government said. So here they said our society does not consider that to be too shocking, too difficult, but having affairs is. So you see that we don't necessarily agree with their decisions, but as much as they try to say that ethics have no place in government, ethics are private, they're religious based, and government is secular, nevertheless there is. Right? There are society's standards of what we'll accept and what we won't accept. Like we all know you can't go into a movie theater and yell fire, right, for just for fun. Because people will get killed. What you've done it will have an effect. You, there are certain things that are that you can do, 
right, which have an effect on others. And therefore, they felt that this dating, uh, this affair business that would set up dates between people was beyond it, but a woman breastfeeding in public was not, right? So, you know, we, we, can, we can see the difference and we can see that idea. But what we're seeing is that society will accept certain things and society will not accept other things. And it all depends on the society and the city and the neighborhood and so forth. But the society here has standards. And, uh, and if those standards slip to a point, then people will act differently. So if you're in a society where nobody has affairs, where everybody takes this extremely seriously, and they don't do it, for a woman to have an affair is an enormous thing. It's like, you know, back in the days where women wore skirts down to their ankles, if they showed their, someone showed their knee, it was like a, a, an unbelievable scandal, right? The, even their ankle, if their skirts were below their ankles, so it was like a scandal. Here, if you have a society where nobody has affairs and it's and it's known that it's not the thing that it's a wrong thing to do, then then this woman does it. That's an enormous scandal, right? The fact that you didn't have such a scandal and people were doing this, and he and the co this guy happens to be walking by the temple and he sees this woman who had an affair die before his eyes, which means society is allowing these things to happen. That he and he's a part of society. Now he feels I have to do. Something something. I have to act. I have to make sure I don't, you know, let, allow this to happen, and I have to make sure that I don't allow myself to become like that. So he goes and he becomes a Nazarite, or she, you know, right? But they become a, a, a Nazir, and and they follow these rules you know, by that basis because of because of that. Yes. Um, I just, I don't want to take away from what you said, but I just want to expand it a little more because I think people will understand and then understand how society or the government had a difficult time with the, um, the website, I think it was, and I'm guessing about three years ago, and they said that, um, whatever company it was, they were going to pay for all the TTC and new subways. Does everybody remember this? It was just about three years ago. So if, if they could have it on the buses and, I don't know, subways, they were going to pay for it. And so the government, in my opinion, was in an awkward situation. Do they go with this? Or gee, they can have everything paid for. Mm -hmm. And the government wow. chose that's to ban it. Right. And that even speaks more highly for the government. That's, that's that what I'm saying. Yeah, so I wanted to say that what, he's, what the rabbi is saying was even more so because they were offering to pay for all, all the transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it possible that the Nazir was the guy who cheated with the woman? Um, very unlikely because the Talmud tells us that the man who has the affair dies also. So he wouldn't be around. I thought so. Yeah, because you didn't mention that. Okay. So the um, so the, here you have this uh, this idea with the Nazarite. Now the question is, just because he sees this happen, why does he have to go? And for instance, it says he has to let his hair grow long. Right? He can't cut his hair, and he, he can't drink wine. These are among the things he can't do. Now some of them, of course. You can understand that, like drinking wine, getting drunk, a person who abuses drinking wine is going to do things that maybe are not 100% appropriate because they've lost control. So I can understand that, you know, in light of what's going on, that that would be the case. Like growing your hair long, right, is a sign that you're not going to take interest in your looks. But you're gonna, you, you don't care. I don't care how I look. I'm not dealing with how I look right now. I'm dealing with a shock therapy to help myself grow spiritually very quickly, because I don't want something to happen. But the commentaries want to know why do you have to do anything? Like why do you have to actually let your hair grow? Don't drink wine. Why does all of these things have to happen? And here they say that that in order for a person to truly create a change in themselves, you have to do an action. Uh, many people think, and it's, a, it's very common with some, even with some of the, what they call streams of Judaism, that they believe that you know, God gave us these mitzvahs. Behind every mitzvah, there are reasons. Some of the reasons we don't know, but there are reasons. And, they, and so this group say that if you can learn the reason without doing the mitzvah, you don't have to do the mitzvah. But doing the mitzvah is only to help you understand the reason behind it, and then you'll learn the ethic and you'll follow the ethic. This is not true. I'm not advocating this. This is what they say, and uh, and it's and the reason that we can see it's not true is not simply because I don't believe it. I mean, it makes it, it doesn't make sense. The whole idea is as follows: that we see throughout history. This is based on the Rambam's opinion that any time. 
that you want to have a, a custom, an ideal, uh, an ethic continue from generation to generation that people should follow it, there has to be a physical action attached to it. If you attach a physical action to this belief, then people will continue to have that belief. For instance, we, uh, we, you know, we want to remember the going out of Egypt, the whole idea of going out of Egypt. So we eat matzah. Right? If we didn't eat matzah, then people would not remember going out of Egypt to the same extent. And what's my proof? My proof is, is you go to any Jew who's not raised observant and ask him about the holiday of Shavuos, which is coming next week, the holiday of Shavuot. It's the holiday, one of the three major holidays of the year. It's as important as Passover and Sukkot, just as important. And it's a holiday that when the Torah was given, right, you go and ask people, they'll know about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, they'll know about Pesach, they'll know about Sukkot, but they will not know about Shavuos. And the reason that they don't, I believe, is because every one of those other holidays have a physical action that you do. Every Jew, no matter how far they are from Judaism, knows that you eat matzah on Passover. Everyone knows you light a menorah on Hanukkah. Everyone knows you sit in the sukkah or shake a lulav. They know these things. People, it's a known thing. This is, a, it's not the message of Passover that they all know. It's the action that we do. We eat matzah. Because you eat matzah, m most people will know why we eat matzah, because it's something that we do. But on Shavuos, there's no physical act. There's no, there's no mitzvah of eating something, sitting somewhere, going somewhere. There's no mitzvah. Uh, that we have a custom to learn Torah the entire night of Shavuos, but it's a custom. It's not a law. It's not a mitzvah. It's simply a custom. There are no clear mitzvahs on the holiday of Shavuos. And because of that, people have forgotten it. And, and you go into the street, people have no idea that one of the major holidays of the Jewish year is in next week. And it's you know, much more significant than Purim, Hanukkah. Now those are rabbinic holidays, this is a Torah holiday. And it's one of the three major holidays of the year. And yet people don't know because there's no action. And, and here's the same idea. The Kohen wants to, I mean the Nazarite, the Nazir wants to learn a specific uh, feeling. He wants to be able to understand that uh, an ethic. He wants to not do what he saw happen. He wants to raise above it. Right? In order for him to do that, it's not enough for him to think about it or to see it. He has to do something physical. So by him not eating wine or him not getting a haircut or him participating in specific things for the Nazir, then he is doing this action which will then cause him to um, to remember and to make, integrate into himself the need to grow spiritually. And that's really the basis behind it. And you'll notice that that's why those people who say in the stream of Judaism that you don't have to do the mitzvah if you know the lesson. The answer is you, you have to do the mitzvah because if you don't do the mitzvah, you might know the lesson, but you won't live the lesson and you won't carry it on. Your children will not know the lesson. Because it's, it's the action that's important. It's the eating of the matzah that's important. It's not just the message. The message is important, but you only only remember it if you do the action. So therefore, in this case, they have to do an action. And these are the actions that they do. And, the, and it explains. Um, Right, it says that he right he takes this oath he won't he shall not drink vinegar or wine um, he shouldn't eat grapes and he's uh, and it goes on about it and he says he shouldn't let a razor pass over his head so he shouldn't cut his hair shouldn't shave his beard until the completion of the th uh, of the time of him being a Nazarite it says to his father to his mother to his brother to his sister he should not contaminate himself that means if one of them dies if his father or mother dies while he's a Nazarite he can't go to the cemetery. It's a very big deal. It's a big deal, right? It doesn't tell you how long this is. The customary thing is 30 days. The co uh, Nazarite does this for 30 days, and then he offers a sacrifice. So why does he offer a sacrifice? Usually, a sacrifice is offered when you've done something wrong, right? And and that's actually the case. Even though this is, God says, if you need a spiritual boost, this is how you can do it. However, it's not the way you should do it. The way you should do it is the way I described before, by being involved in the physical world, by eating 
correctly, by having relations correctly, by ha doing business correctly, not by not doing business, not doing having relations, not being involved with people. It's the opposite. Do it, right? But if, but in this case, he has to go the extra mile. So, but it's not the way Hashem wants it. Uh, we're told that there are a number of questions that God asks us after we die. When we go to heaven, we have a judgment. And he asks us a bunch of questions. One of the questions he asks us has always been very peculiar that people find. A question that he asks is, is um, did you enjoy all of the things I put in this world? But I put apples and oranges, and I put beautiful mountains, and I put all kinds of things. Did you enjoy them? They say, well, what kind of a religious question is that? Religion, you're not supposed to enjoy things. Religion, you're supposed to be spiritual. But that's the point. The, God put all of these different fruits and vegetables and things to look at and things to do in this world for us to make use of them and to you, make them spiritual to use them in a positive way. And if you think that the way that you're going to become spiritual is by not eating, you're wrong. And you will, in the future, you're going to pay, you're going to have a, a, a debt to God. He's, you, when you answer, no, I didn't try all of the things that you made because I wanted to be more spiritual, it's like he's going to say, dummy, like, what do you think I created apples for? <laughs> so you shouldn't eat them? Right? Uh, go ahead and you should have had one. You should have tried it. It would have brought you closer to me, not further. Right? And and that and that's that's an error. And therefore, the the Nazarite who does just that, but he does it for the right reason for a short period of time, still has to offer a sacrifice because it wasn't the right way to do it. It wasn't the preferred way. It was a correct way, but not the preferred way. Now we simply go into the next section, beginning on 762, 763, going into 764 and 5, which is the. Birkas Kohanim, the blessing of the Kohen, beginning on 763 and verse 22, Hashem spoke to Moshe, speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, so shall you bless the children of Israel, saying to them, may Hashem bless you and safeguard you, may Hashem illuminate his countenance for you and be gracious to you, may Hashem lift his countenance to you and establish peace for you, let them place my name upon the children of Israel and I shall bless them. So here is a statement that God says that the Kohanim, the priests, are, are on regular occasions supposed to bless the Jewish people, saying, Yevarecha HaShem V'Yishmarecha. You've heard this line before, I'm sure. We do it um, today. We do it in Ashkenazi uh, circles. We do it on the holidays. If you come to shul on, let's say, on Shavuos, that, that as a part of the service, the Kohanim will come to the front and everybody looks down and the Kohanim say this blessing to everybody. Um, this is done every day in Israel, not just on holidays, every single day. It's done, and the days of the temple, it was done regularly as well by the Kohanim who blessed the Jewish people. And, it's, and they are the conduit from God to give us this blessing, as it says. And if you do this, I will bless them and I will bless you. And this has become a, a very, very important tradition that um, that we do such a thing. Um, and and the, uh, the the blessing is a a three part blessing, and it, it, it it's considered a a very important um, blessing. And it's, as I said, it's still said today. So that's that's found in there as well. <coughs> Okay, well, we're just about to have to finish. All right, so uh, 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 just to conclude, if you go through the whole rest of the parsha, the whole rest of the parsha, for the most part, is a description of each head of each group of the Jewish people. So you've got all the various tribes. So you have the prince of each tribe, the head of each tribe. And on behalf of his tribe, he offers a sacrifice. And that's what happens here in the temple. And that, that was called the Mishkan. It was a portable temple. But he does that. Um, and if you look at it, every sacrifice is the same. They're all the same. Like, so why doesn't God just say each one gave a sacrifice? Right? Why do you have to say, it says, you know, um, on the twelfth day, the leader of the children of Tully, Ahira, son of Anan, he gave an offering. It was one silver bowl, and it goes through this whole thing of what his offering was. And if you look just one chapter, cha one paragraph back, it's the exact same thing with a different name, and one before that, and another one, another name, right? Going all the way back to the beginning, right? So everyone gave the same thing. So just say, and Hashem commanded that each tribe should have its prince come one a day and offer the following sacrifice. 
Why, why give us the longest part of the Torah to tell us this? The Torah has no extra words. So there's a number of important points that we learn from that. One of them is that that while it appears that each sacrifice was the same and physically they were the same, they weren't the same. And they weren't the same because um, what you offer as a sacrifice is significant because the Torah tells you exactly what to offer. So there's a reason for it. It's not just arbitrary. But what distinguishes one from the other is the intention and the thought of the giver. If the person is giving willfully, giving cheerfully, giving with the right thought, so giving as a, on behalf of his people, giving because he wants to have, make the world a better place and people should have better lives. So his sacrifice is going to be very different than the sacrifice of the guy next to him. Um, and therefore, even though it looks the same, and it's the same ingredients and the same thing, then that, nevertheless, it's different. And that's the same thing with us. Even though we are, all have lots of similarities, but when we go to pray or we do a mitzvah, there's a difference how we do mitzvahs. If, I, if someone comes to your door for tzedakah and you open the door and you make a face, and then, or you, they, they come to the door, you just close the door, mm -hmm. or you don't answer the door, or you give them $10 instead of uh, $20, uh, because, and you can give them 20 but you don't. Whatever the case is, if you're not acting correctly right, to that person, compare that to the next door. The next person, guy goes to the next person and he opens the door and he's friendly and he's nice and he invites the person in and he gives him a drink. And that could be that you gave that person 10 times the amount the second person gave. But the second person treated the guy with dignity. So those two people are both giving tzedakah, both giving it the same day, both giving it to the same person, but yet the mitzvah was very different to the two of them. right? And not just the amount that was different, it was the way you did it, even though it seems to be the same mitzvah. That's the idea here. That we need to know that the difference in our obtaining what we want, the spirituality that we want, is not ritual, cold, not understanding ritual. Like everyone says, like, why should I do these things? I don't understand them. Right? The fact is, you should understand them. That's important. You need to know what it's about, what it means. Then when you understand it, right, now apply your personality to it. Make it, make it raise you up. Don't knock down the mitzvah. Make the mitzvah higher. And, and that even though it looks like everyone's doing the same thing, we're not doing the same thing. We're all doing it based on who we are. That's one. The second thing is, is that you know, the first guy comes on the first day, he's the prince, and he gives a sacrifice. Now the, sac the prince comes the second day, different prince. Now he knows that the guy before me gave something. Now he has a dilemma. What am I going to do? If I give the same as him, I'm giving the same as him. If I give different, like I'm going to one-up him. He's giving this, I'm going to give a little bit better. So what happens? So if he gives, gives that guy gives, you know, five cows. Now I'm coming, I'm going to give six cows. So the guy after me has got to outdo me too, right? So we're going to have 12 guys. By the time we're done, we've got 25 cows, right? But that's fine. We all want to do the best we can. It's for a sacrifice. The other hand, if I give exactly the same as the guy before me, I'm making a statement. I'm saying that I, we're not here to outdo each other. We're not here to make each other look bad. We're here to express the will of God. And therefore, I'm going to give the same. And, and what happens next? Now, the guy after me, let's say he doesn't give the same. Well, that's going to be hard for him to do because he sees the first two people gave the same. Now, I'm going to be the bad guy and say, I'm going to be like a child. i got to do better than them. right? I'm going to give more. right? He's going to look silly. So he's going to have to do what I did. And that goes through the entire group until you get to the end. They all give the same. I mean, so it's all, all, all depend. The second guy is really the pivotal guy. Everything's based on him. Let's update it. All right. Let's, let's say that we're making bar mitzvah, a bar mitzvah for our, our son. And every one of us have a son who's the same age, and they're all going to be bar mitzvah within the same year. So we one after another. So every week you come to show and we have a bar mitzvah over the next three months. Right. So the first one comes, and we've got you know. Mr. You know, Mr. Shapiro, and he makes a bar mitzvah for his son, and everybody's invited to lunch, and he has he has a lunch, and he has bread, and he's kugel and chicken, and he has a piece of cake for dessert. So the next week comes out, now your turn. Well, what did they have the week before? Well, I can't give that. I mean, they just had that last week. So I gotta up it. I gotta now have a chicken breast, not a piece of chicken. I can't just have a piece of cake. I gotta have a dessert buffet. You know, that's fine for the second guy. What about the third one? Now the third one comes, he's gotta up it even more. So by the time every one of us has made bar mitzvahs for our kids, we're like throwing weddings. Mm -hmm. Like we're making these enormous events. Mm -hmm. and, and we've lost touch with what we're trying to do, right? That's one of the points. And this person is making a statement that it's, 
What? You're thinking about yourself. Right. Well, because I, I don't want to be like everyone else. I want to be better. So the, this guy's making a statement. The worth of your bar mitzvah is not what you spend on it. It's what's in your head. What, what is your feeling? What is your accomplishments? What did your child do? What's important to you? So therefore, he, he made that statement. When he gave the exact same thing as the one before him, he's making the statement that it's not, what, it's not just what you give, which it is important what you give, but it's, what, it's more than that. It's what's in your heart and what's, what's, what you're doing and how your frame of mind is. Right? That's really the idea. As therefore, when they went and gave these sacrifices and they all gave the same thing, they're saying to us, when, you know, last week you had a bar mitzvah in the shul, right? This week, we, all right, and you, can, you can have the same thing. All right, so that you don't want to have barbecue chicken, so you can have fried chicken. But you don't have to outdo them. You can have the same thing. Nobody will be upset. And you're making a statement that, right, that we have, we have Rachmanis on the money of the Jewish people, that they shouldn't have to get a, a mortgage just to be able to make a bar mitzvah with their kid. They don't have to keep upping it and upping it and upping it to outdo each other. We, let's try other ways of accomplishing and being unique. It doesn't have to be with how we spend money. And therefore, that's what the statement he's making. And it's an important statement. Because we get to, it's something that we can't allow ourselves to fall into. Because if we do, it only causes hatred and fighting and wasting of money and putting people in situations they can't afford. And we see what happens, right? In the Talmud, it, 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 they tell a story. That, you know, they made laws about uh, when someone dies, what they have to wear. You put, you know, you put on a, a deceased person special clothes. They put on them. They have a special outfit. Now, they, that outfit is made out of linen, 100% linen. And so the, they ask why. This is because in the days of the mission, the linen was the cheapest type of cloth that you could get. And what was happening is, is that people were doing funerals, and they're all trying to outdo each other. And it got to the point where people couldn't afford to do funerals, and they were letting people, dead bodies just lay in the street. Because they, they, somebody in their family died, they knew they were going to go bankrupt. So they would just leave the body there and move away. Because they, they couldn't do it. They, they, they couldn't make this, you know, all, all of the extravagances and everything that was tied in with it, and, you know, the casket and fancy clothes for the deceased person and everybody else at all these, it was just too much. So the rabbis came and made the rules. One of the rules was you put a deceased person in the cheapest clothes. You use a pine box, a cheap pine box. Don't go crazy with the stuff, right? They made these rules so that people wouldn't do those things. They wouldn't start competing and upping and upping and upping. So you see, way back in the days of the mission, this was going on, so that each person wanted to outdo the one before him until it got to the point that nobody could handle it anymore unless you're the richest person in the world. So there, so it's the same thing here. When we're doing bar mitzvahs and weddings and kiddushes, there's nothing wrong if you're a person of some wealth to add in something. That's fine. But to, but to set the standard so high and to constantly outdo the one before you is going to cause all of us unneeded jealousy and fighting, unneeded wasting of money, putting people in situations that they can't afford. Right? And that, and that, and those are very dangerous things. So here the Torah is telling us by adding all of this section, I mean words and sentences and paragraphs that are totally seem to be unnecessary because they're simply repeating each other to set home to us this is not repeating each other. The difference isn't in what kind of chicken you serve. The difference is in what's in your head and what your purpose is of why you're doing this in the first place. That's the message that they tell us. Okay?